Good evening, uh, everyone. I'd like to um, welcome you to the Dare County Board of Commissioners October the 19th Board of Commissioners meeting. And um, at this time, I'd like to um, um, present a uh, letter and invocation from uh, George Laurie, who is with the um, North Dare Ministers Association. He writes, um, first of all, I want to thank the Dare County Commissioners for allowing members of the North Dare Ministers Association to open each of your meetings with a prayer. It's been seven months since my last prayer, and that almost coincides with the shutdown for the coronavirus. I've asked God to guide our president and our federal government agencies and our governor and our state officials as they have planned and continue to plan a workable response to this crisis. But I wish to concentrate my thoughts into guiding our commissioners, our Dare County agencies, our local officials, and our local business owners to continue working together as well as you have managed the impact of this pandemic on our beach community. You have made it through the tourist season relatively unscathed, and this is most commendable. As I have noted before, the citizens of Dare County always look out for one another in weather-related crises, and I expect it will be no different this time around. Under God's watch, this tourist season appears to have been even busier than ever. But we cannot let our guard down as a second wave can appear at any time now. Let our firm belief in God guide us to make the difficult decisions that lie ahead. In this stressful time, let us remember that consensus and listening to others is a good thing. Respect your fellow human beings at all times. This is what leaders do, and I applaud all of you, past and present, for trying to do the right by the OBX. And lastly, a major election is near, with many of us concerned about its impact upon our democratic institutions. But enough said about that. Locally, everything will be fine. So let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, sovereign of all, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and brought us to this season. We thank you and sing your praises for our lives which are in your hand and for our souls which are in your keeping. You are goodness. You are compassion. You have always been our hope. Soften our hearts and open our minds. Grace us with your light when our path grows dark, with your strength when we grow weary, and with your support when we falter in our resolve. King of the universe, you have commanded us to do your work for the betterment of the Outer Banks. Be with these commissioners and others who serve their county on a daily basis. Guide them in what con continues to be the challenge of a lifetime. May this be God's will, and let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, and have a blessed day and blessed holiday season. May we stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, for one nation, for one nation, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> County Manager, I'll turn the agenda over to you. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Item one on the agenda is the Chairman's opening remarks. Thank you, County Manager. I have a few things this evening to go over. Um, the first item I have is, um, as most of you are certainly are aware, um, early voting, um, uh, also known as one-stop absentee voting, allows many registered voters to cast an absentee ballot in person on select days to, prior to the election day, which election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Uh, those uh, not registered may register when they vote during early voting, unlike election day, 
when registered voters can only vote at their specific precinct. Early voting allows registered voters to vote at an early voting site in the county. And that started um, um, October the 15th. Uh, the three, there are three locations that you can uh, early vote. That's the Dare County Administrative Building here at 954 Marshall Collins Drive in, in Manio. The other location is Kill Devil Hills Commissioner's Meeting Room. That's 102 Town Hall in Kill Devil Hills. And then the third location is Cape Hatteras uh, Secondary School Auditorium, which is at 48576 North Carolina Highway 12 in Buxton. The sites are open weekdays, uh, as I mentioned, open October the 15th and they'll run through October the 30th from 8 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. And on Saturdays, October the 17th and the 24th from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then the last day of early voting will take place on Saturday, October the 31st from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. So if you need more information uh, on one-stop absentee voting, and other ways to vote, I would uh, respectfully request that you visit darenc.com slash voting. Um, I know that um, this is a uh, uh, very, very uh, important time of year, and I encourage everyone to exercise their right to vote. And it's been very, very encouraging so far just to see uh, uh, what's taken place just in the uh, several days that uh, early voting has already taken place. Um, the second item I have this evening is the 2020 census. Um, it's over. It ended uh, October the 15th. Uh, I do want to um, thank all of our citizens who, um, who took part uh, in this census. Uh, it takes place every 10 years, and this is very, very critical for funding for our county, for our state. And um, I just want to uh, take this moment uh, just to thank everyone that did complete that uh, surveys uh, uh, for sending those in. It's, it's very, very much uh, appreciated. Um, third item I have is uh, certainly kudos to the Roanoke Island Women's Club. Once again, um, they are in their 30th year this year um, for, for, for providing Thanksgiving baskets for our citizens in DARE. Um, last year, uh, Thanksgiving baskets went out to 49 DARE County families, and they, are, they assisted 87 more families with gift cards to the local grocery stores. So it just goes to show you how caring and giving our community is. There are several ways, uh, two ways you can join uh, uh, to assist uh, in 2020. Uh, you may send a tax deduct deductible donation to the Roanoke Island Women's Club at P.O. Box 16666 here in Manio, 27954. And that money will be used to buy gift certificates uh, to local grocery stores uh, for uh, uh, families. Or you can donate items needed, including a turkey for traditional <coughs> Thanksgiving dinner. So if you have time, um, please help the uh, Roanoke Island Women's Club. They do a fantastic job. If you have any questions about the baskets, uh, you can contact Chelsea Green, and she can be reached at 703-398-7360. Or you can also reach out to Lee Brinkley, who is with uh, Dare County DSS, and uh, she can be reached uh, via email at lee.brinkley at darenc.com. Uh, could, could you repeat Chelsea's phone number? Yeah, absolutely, Jim. 703-398-7360. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> We have a meeting this week. This is uh, really, really uh, exciting um, to uh, get to the final stages of uh, our COA.
project here in Manio for our um, um, f new, new classroom and facilities. As most of you are aware, the last few several weeks, the demolition's taken place. But this week, uh, tomorrow, we'll be meeting with our architect um, to finalize some uh, uh, exterior uh, sub uh, cladding and whatever we're going to use and co pick some colors and we'll do the same thing interior-wise. So that's pretty exciting. We're, we're really getting down to the nitty-gritty now when we get to that. So that'll be, uh, that'll be exciting. To that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. That's correct. So we're looking forward, looking forward to that um, tomorrow morning with, with that meeting. Um, we also had a, uh, another exciting uh, event uh, this past week, last Wednesday. Uh, we, sell, we expanded the welding program uh, for COA in Dare County. Um, Commissioner Ross and Commissioner Couch and Commissioner Bateman were there with, with me. I know the vice chair was out of town, but uh, what, a, what a, another outstanding uh, move towards uh, um, uh, helping our, our technical um, folks in Dare County. The students they had nine new booths there. They're pretty exciting to see that program. They got a waiting list. So this, this is... Um, you know, Mr. Chairman, that equipment, yeah. those welding labs that were created were state-of-the-art in the country. I yes. mean, this is leading edge, the finest equipment for training that's available. So that was very impressive. It was very impressive, Commissioner Ross, absolutely. And uh, I, I couldn't be more excited to see that program grow. And like I say, they got a waiting list, so that's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and then uh, finally, the last item I have, uh, I thought we had some photos uh, uh, of that. Um, Matt, can you, there's pictures of state of the art. We had, there's a nine new um, welding booth, and, um, and, and that's, that's just really, really um, exciting to see that uh, take place. Uh, and that's a, that's a photo of it, and we'd cut the ribbon for that. The next item I have, we're in our 150th anniversary this year, but this is pretty exciting. I, I read, this was on uh, The Voice um, uh, just uh, yesterday, today. Um, if you're looking to make some history uh, while you're on the, on the Outer Banks, if you're a visitor or if you're a local resident, this is pretty exciting. You can fly, and, and if you'll post that up, uh, Matt, you can fly a, a reproduction of the Wright Brothers 1902 glider. The replica was built by the Wright Experience, and it's one of few in, in existence today. It's also the only one of its kind available for the public to fly. The 1902 Wright Glider replica is, is uh, museum quality. It allows participants to experience exactly what the Wright brothers felt as they prepared for the historic flight of the first powered plane in 1903. Your five flights, uh, evidently you get, if you'll leave that up, Matt, I'd appreciate it. Your five flights over the dunes will be just like the White Brothers did, and you'll be one of the few in the world to ever fly this glider just as the Wright Brothers did over the same sand over 100 years ago. This is pretty exciting. A normal flight would be about five to 15 feet off the ground and about 50 yards in distance. After the flight, um, they encourage you to visit the Wright Brothers National Memorial and walk the hallowed ground where the Wright Brothers perfected their flying machine in 1902. And it changed the world with their powered flight in 1903. You can book, um, your 1902 Wright Glider experience uh, with Kitty Hawk kites uh, on Jockey's Ridge, and that's 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 pretty incredible. I mean, that that's a replica, mm -hmm. and and there's only a few of these in the country, so that this is something uh, pretty exciting to, to see. There's a video on uh, Kitty Hawk kites website. Oh, excuse me, and the voice has it too. So I encourage you to go uh, look at it. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. They, 
did it the same way the Wright brothers did. They had two or three people just towing them with tow lines and then letting them go and, and fly. So that's um, uh, pretty exciting. So I wanted to bring that to each, everyone's attention. County manager, that's all I have under uh, uh, chairman's business. Chairman, item two on the agenda is public comment. Um, <coughs> we'll wait a second to see if we get any public comment. Any public comment that we've received up through now prior to the meeting, you all have. So we've delivered all the any letters or emails or whatever we've got in the way of public comment to you already. Yeah, I believe at this time uh, we've had um, uh, we've had the three, um, and each one of our commissioners have have those uh, printed in front of. Them. I'll give you a few more minutes to. See if we have any more come come in. Anything else? That would be public comment unless you want to speak. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Commissioners. Hope everyone's doing well, family's doing well. Fine, thank you. Would you um, state name? George Carver, the executive director of Dare Minority Coalition. Um, I sent you guys, everyone on the board, an email earlier. I know it was last minute thing, but I just would like to make the presentation personally to you guys myself about the memorandum of understanding that I have or DMC have proposed as far as actually acquiring affordable housing. Um, talking to Commissioner Ross, um, last year, he said, George Carver, I want you to know and find out everything possible about affordable housing. And um, within the two years, uh, it's been um, the executive director of the Minority Coalition. Um, pretty much my time has been based upon this. And um, the, the MOU that you gentlemen receive um, later this afternoon um, is based upon that. And before I can move forward with our steps, I would like to know that I'm actually back and have assistance and knowing that Dare County is not only using one source of interest as far as finding affordable housing or essential housing as Commissioner Rob used, but affordable housing, low income tax credit. Been the only, um, as far as I know, the CDC here in Dare County and a 501c3, the, the incentives that Dare County can receive and the benefits that they can receive for is sponsoring a nonprofit actually acquiring affordable housing is great upon these days and times. So I just wanted um, to present myself face-to-face uh, -to, -face to you gentlemen and let y'all know the type of email that y'all did receive and the option that's on the table that's been presented to you guys. So um, I love the work with you and um, there's great opportunities um, in the midst as far as having affordable, low-income tax credit houses here in Dare County. Not only that, um, just 
Um, a few months, a few weeks ago, I established um, being part of the largest nonprofit real estate firm, PC real estate firm. I've just established a branch here that's actually acquiring HUD homes and also foreclosed homes. If the room run out as far as like building, um, we actually acquired these properties for low income families to actually be able to live in these homes. And on top of that, you know, just working with other organizations, we are having um, a housing counseling program to establish with our nonprofit and also working with a bank to establish <coughs> money management program as well. So we're just not putting low income families into these homes. They actually have a program established for them. So after a certain per period of time staying in these homes, uh, as far as like the transition is homes, they actually know the basic means of money management and be able to actually establish their own ways of staying, living in their own property with, instead of using um, the help of um, the county or the state assistance. So um, I know you guys love fishing being here in Dare County, but um, I never went fishing with one fishing pole ever. So um, it's just that mind state. You would like to have more than one hook in the water when you're trying to establish something just as great as affordable and essential housing here in Dare County. Thank you for your time. Um, that's all I have right now. I look forward from your emails and a response back. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Yes, sir. Are you going to stick around for a pre the presentation? Yes, I will. Yeah. Yes, I will. <laughs> I think you'll like it. <clears throat> County man. Chairman, that would end the public comment, and that moves us to item three on the agenda. Item three is the uh, travel trailer park ordinance that was presented at the last board meeting. Uh, we now have to have a public hearing with regard to that. Um, you may have received correspondence with regard to that or emails, and if you did, then they're in your packet as well. Um, because we also will have a live public hearing if there's anyone here who'd like to speak, and I think we have at least one speaker here that would like to speak to that. Uh, tonight as well. So with that said, this is the public hearing. This is for the re revised travel trailer park ordinance and the uh, C3 text amendment. Uh, as with other public hearings, uh, the time is limited to five minutes. Uh, when you come to the podium, please state your name, where you're from, and please limit your time. Um, at the With about a minute to go, I'll tell you that your time is almost up, and with five minutes to go, then you would need to conclude your remarks. With that said, I think we have one speaker. If you come forward, please. Good evening. My name is John Robbins. I reside at 109 Puddle Lane in Manteo. I come before you tonight to talk during public comments for the proposed travel trailer park ordinance. Um, first, before I get going, it's been five months since uh, the county first started working on this ordinance, and um, the county's done a good job, especially staff in doing such, and I believe the ordinance before you tonight is a good ordinance, and so um, they were a pleasure to work with, so I thank them for that. There's one item in the ordinance, though, that I'm speaking to you before this evening, and that is the limitation on cabins, and um, I know it's all or nothing there. There's either a 50% limitation, or 100%, um, you can have 100% cabins. I would ask just as a compromise, something 70% um, cabins, a limitation. And that would, um, while it's only 20% more, it means a lot to my project and I would appreciate the support that would be given to such. Now you may ask why the importance of cabins? Well, for the past several years, I've been working on a site in Skyco on Roanoke Island. And it's not just for that property, I would look at it for other properties, such as little parcels on Hatteras Island or other places there. And what I'm proposing is a new camping ex experience, a newer concept, one that takes um, that's found across the state and the country, and is one where there are resort-style accommodations, and they're designed to blend in with the surrounding environment and landscape and the natural beauty that surrounds it. And basically, you're taking a hotel and those units, and you're disintegrating them disintegrating them in these cabins that are spread across the landscape. Um, they're a place with deep respect for the landscape and, you know, it's one where you work with the landscape rather than disrupting it. 
The cabins would reside in protected areas on the property. The property is very unique, um, and it would work with, um, they'd be clean, uh, modern, organic designs, and they would adapt to the local topography instead of um, further disrupting it with grading and clearing of trees. Um, the proposed limitation of 70% on cabins would provide a better, better balance for uh, my site and others and would minimize the impacts to the development of the property the travel trailers and other recreational vehicles require, such as the following, but not limited to wider roadways, greater clearing and grading, and increased stormwater runoff. One other item that I've heard commonly is, um, when, it is a, when is, it, is it a campground and doesn't simply become a minor subdivision with small houses? I would ask, when does a travel trailer park consisting of 100% travel trailers you know, limit itself to a campground and not transform into simply a trailer park? And I would say that that's done with codes and enforcement of those codes. Also, there's certificates that have been <clears throat> signed by the owner. And again, staff has done a good job in putting that in there that, again, prevents travel trailer parks from simply becoming travel or trailer parks. Then some can, will say, well, why not? Why don't you develop it under a group development? And I would say that there's many obstacles. I don't want a subdivision. I want a campground. And the campground ordinance that we've worked on for four months better responds to such. One of the items in a group development, you're required to have a minimum of 45 foot right of ways for your roadway. The roadways have to be 20 foot wide. They have to be paved with asphalt. And so for these little cabins that I want to sprinkle across the environment, you would have to go out there and grade these large roadways. And that's not required in the proposed or, or ordinance for consideration before you tonight. Those roadways allow for the ordinance has presented allows for 12 foot roadways for about a minute left. Okay, 12 foot roadways for um, one way travel, and then they can also be gravel. The next is um, there's been a loss of hotel motel hotel style units. These will better adhere to that. There hasn't been a hotel constructed on Roanoke Island in some time. These this will appeal to people that don't want to stay or don't have travel trailers. The next is economic impact and safety. The cabins have to be built, built to FEMA standards and um, building code, and um, there's more trades involved in development. It'll increase the tax base for Dare County. And um, I would just ask that it's important to me. I know that y'all have all been in business where there's things that you hang your hat on, and this is important to me, and I think it's good for not only myself, but Dare County and other people who are wanting to pursue the same idea. And um, that's it, and I wish I had more time. And I appreciate the ones who I called and that they spoke to and they took the time. I greatly appreciate that. And for the others, I just wish that we could add more conversation in regards to such. And I thank you for your time, and I hope you considered the 70%. And um, I'm sure the attorney can uh, discuss if we need a public hearing. This, I don't want to be difficult. I'd just like to move it on, but it is important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to this issue? Any other speakers? Um, seeing none, Mr. Chairman, that would close this public hearing. Um, and it's now before you to act. Donna is here if you have questions. Um, I talk, we don't really have anything else to add that we didn't discuss at the last meeting. Um, but if you have questions or other concerns, then uh, we're here to answer those questions. Anyone? Uh, Donna, you mind coming forward? And, uh, We'll see if uh, anyone uh, has any questions of you with respect to. Uh... I, I had just a quick one. Yes, sir, Commissioner uh, Ross. A travel trailer park would imply a mobile living unit that pulls in and pulls out. A mobile home park implies homes brought in, basically established, and they are stationary for potentially long periods of time. I'm, I'm looking for the nod that, yeah, yes, you're sir, so far, that is you're correct. Okay. Mobile homes or manufactured homes have to be uh, issued a building permit. They yes. have to meet certain building code standards, right. uh, HUD standards. They're manufactured to HUD standards. They're elevated on a permanent foundation. Uh, well, RVs are 
not built to building code they're intended to be right. a recreational temporary uh, unit right. for for yeah. not for permanent housekeeping and they have to be kept in a highway ready state according to the travel trailer park ordinance and the flood ordinance which is the wheels have to be on it they have to have insurance and they which have is to much different from a mobile home park which is set into the lot yes, the other sir. question i had um, as Mr. Roberts asked, what's the difference between a travel trailer and a trailer park? Are the lot sizes identical? No, sir. A travel trailer park can have a, a 1,500 square foot site. Ah. A mobile home park has to have a 15,000 square foot site, the same as if it's a subdivision of land, if it's connected to central water. If ten, it's not ten times the size of the travel trailer lot? Yes, sir. Ah, okay. Thank you. That's all I had. Anyone else have any uh, questions? Yeah, I've got one, um, Commissioner <clears throat> Tobin. Is there an opportunity in the near future to revisit uh, the cabin structures on these parks and and maybe increase it to 100 percent, but with some other limitations? Certainly, if that is the instruction from the board, we can do that. Um, the way that the hearing was advertised was with the 50% split as recommended by the planning board or the removal of that. When we were drafting the travel trailer park ordinance, we went through a lot of different uh, variations of drafts that I uh, presented to the planning board. And in one of those drafts, there was 100% cap and option that had some particular standards that went with that. When the planning board made their recommendation for the 50-50 split, those standards were pulled out. So I still have those. Um, and if that's the you know, consensus of the board to do that, then I can certainly bring that back at some point in time. It's fairly easy to do. I've got the framework for it already written out. Okay, thank you. I did some deep diving on this project. and. Um, some of the things that were inconsistent between some of the projects and some of uh, the, the ordinances were the consideration of wetlands and how the wetlands coverage relates to lot size and coverage of the buildable areas on the land. Um, it would be nice if we could pretty much make those comparable at some point maybe. Um, I don't know if you guys understand what I'm saying or not, but I think if I you have the group, the group housing developments, the wetlands are included in the area. Uh, in the trailer park ones, it's not. So to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They're, they should be similar. I'm not saying exactly the same, but um, if you're taking into consideration 400 acres of wetlands on on one project and allowing more density on the buildable land and then on another project you've got 400 acres of wetlands with approximately the same amount of buildable land and you're not allowing more lot coverage only allowing 30 percent to me it just it doesn't seem fair it seems like they should be somewhat equitable and <clears throat> the cluster home or group developments that land can be transferred that, that those those homes can be purchased and lived in year-round with the with the this model, um, they can't. So the, the issue Bobby. of the wetlands is, is basically a density question. And when yeah. and when you have those different, you, whether you use the wetlands or not, will determine how many units you can get on the high portion. Where you have used the wetlands, you also have larger lots. So in the mobile home scenario where you have a 15,000 square foot lot versus a 1,500 square foot pad, using the wetlands results in some density, but you still have to have a 15,000 square foot lot. Whereas if you made those the same and you had a 1,500, you could essentially put unlimited, I mean, it would, the density wouldn't match if, you, if that makes sense to you because you've got yeah. such small <laughs> lot spaces. So somehow... What you've got to decide is what kind of density do you want for whatever kind of development that you want, and then how do you regulate that? If you choose to include wetlands, then you just simply come back and say, okay, the lots have to be a certain size, and wetlands either count or don't count, but you're going to wind up with the same density on your highlands, and you all have to decide what is an acceptable density for that. So 
what yeah, you're asking what for I, can be done once you tell us making. whatever the density needs to be on it. I just think it should be revisited and made a little bit more equitable and comparable to each other. Right, but the main I, difference I, is, is is that campgrounds are considered a commercial use with the 60% lot coverage and the group housing is considered residential yes. with the 30%. But there are differences in the way that the group housing is set up in, with the lot coverage, you're exactly correct. And it's how those wetlands are calculated. The ordinance that's in front of you tonight calculates that 60% lot coverage, but it excludes the wetlands. Well, my opinion is I think we need to probably pass this ordinance as written and then have you revisit the thing. And I know you've done work on it already and have, I have, and, it, and and have a draft it, proposal. It, it so just it, so <laughs> happens that the, the draft language that I had written up for the 100% camper cabins had a sliding scale of density in the higher the percentage of wetlands were, the lower the density of the units that were allowed. Just FYI. Okay. Donna, just a question. The, the, the lot size uh, is the same whether it's a cabin or a travel trailer. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The site size, yes, sir. So so if if um, at some later time a, a cabin could be built upon a plot or a, a space that was originally travel trailers were using? Yes, sir. Is that correct? So for clarification, so if, say, for instance, he wanted to come back and wanted, and we decided we wanted to have a lot of 100%, all you got to do is bring it back to us, and we change it from 50 to 100%. You would be taking out the language that said any travel trailer park that rec that included camper cabins ha would, has to have 50%, so you would be taking that cap out, yes, sir? Right. Right. If it was changed, if we adopt it tonight and it includes that language, then it's certainly your prerogative to take that language out at any time that you see fit following adequate public hearing and notice. Anyone else? There was a second uh, comment uh, on this from uh, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Joe Thompson, yes, sir. Yeah. And, and what, what is the impact of what we do tonight? How does that impact that, that project? He, he has an existing commercial site in which he is hoping to, if you will, for lack of a better term, drop some travel trailer sites in there, incorporate them into the overall site that he has. And that is a new section that's included in the draft that you have in front of you that is specific to having travel trailer sites in conjunction with existing commercial and that's travel trailer sites, not camper cabins. And so if it's adopted tonight, then he will be able to proceed forward with his site plan that he submitted for the planning board meeting in November. If you do not adopt it tonight, then his plan will be held up and he'll have to come up with some other idea. And is he not the one that generated the um, change in the ordinance to his site plan? No, sir. It just so happened that he came in and talked to me the day that the planning board was having their initial discussion. I had been receiving um, inquiries from one of the larger campgrounds down in Hatteras Island about incorporating camper cabins into their layout. and. The ordinance, as it's written now, does not address them. We had um, Mr. Fearing, who was in front of the board, who wanted to have one camper cabin out there, and then Mr. Robbins, who has been very involved in the planning board review, has uh, talked about a sketch plan, but he has not made a formal submission, so I can't comment on the ratio of his camper cabins except to say that he's been very um, vocal in saying that he plans to have some. One, one caution, board, is you're changing an ordinance that affects the whole county and anything in the zones in which this ordinance impacts, and right. you can't do this project specific. So irrespective of the impact that it may have to Mr. Thompson's project or Mr. Robbins' project, you, it's not a project specific. It's, it's going to be available anywhere in the county that meets the zoning criteria, not just to them. And so we got to be sure that we're, right. we're looking at it from the big picture and not from a project perspective approach. Exactly. Exactly. Anyone else? Then I would ask the pleasure of the board. I'll make a motion to adopt it 
um, with the 50-50 and also to instruct staff to uh, revisit uh, the draft report that you've been working on and maybe come back in December time frame and we can look at it again. All right, so just so I'm sure, clear on your motion. Motion to adopt. The, the motion is to adopt as recommended by the planning yes. board, which uh, uh, <clears throat> revises the travel trailer park and campground ordinance and associated C3 text amendments be adopted as recommended by the planning board and further move to adopt the finding of consistency statement included in the board's packet and also to add um, take this uh, 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 under advisement and bring back um, uh, something to us late in the year with respects to, for lack of a better term, percentages? Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Commissioner Tobin. And is there a second to that motion? I'll second. It's, it's been seconded by Commissioner House then. The floor then is open for additional discussion. Hearing no, Danny, uh, Commissioner Couch. Yep. Uh, Donna, uh, what's a realistic time frame? I mean, if, if he gets 60 days in December late in the year, is, is that going to be of any consequence to do some additional planning? for? No, sir. I can – you have to have a recommendation from the planning board on any zoning amendment by law, and so I can place this on the planning board's agenda for their November meeting. We can get a recommendation from the plan from the planning board in November. I can be back in front of you in the first meeting in December. We can have a public hearing at the second meeting in December. So we could put this to bed by the end of the year, assuming that everything goes according to plan. Because I have the language drafted. It's just a matter of reflecting the board's comments. Right, into I it. Right. That. Thank you. But if the planning board has other ideas and their recommendation takes more than one meeting, then that gets pushed back. We'll come to you and tell you that's where we are, but right. we can go on Donna's schedule that she just suggested unless it elicits uh, uh, more conversation than we anticipate. Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would presume that that's going to be more conversation than we may be looking at. So I would be very optimistic if you would come back to us by, <laughs> October, by, no, by December, but hopefully by the Sometime yeah. in the first quarter. I, that's and, where, I, and I, I in all due respect for clarification, but I'm looking at these folks and I've listened to them for several years now. I don't think these things in the regs and ordinances are kind of accidental. You guys put a lot of thought into this, so I'm kind of curious, but I think there's probably a lot of good thinking that's gone into all of the zoning and ordinances that have taken place, so... We'll report back yeah, to the first meeting that's in December, and if we're ready, we'll keep going. If we're not, we'll tell you tell you why. Right. Okay. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Anyone else? With that being said, those in favor of the motion as presented signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Chairman, item four on the agenda is the report from uh, UNC School Government DFI. Um, Sarah Odio couldn't be here today, so Marsha Parrott is going to make that presentation. Um, she's on our Zoom thing, and if Matt would flip over to that, then we can ask her to begin that presentation <laughs> with regard to our affordable housing plans. Welcome, Mary. Marcia. Marcia, excuse me. Hey, good evening. How are y'all doing? <coughs> good, how are you? Thanks. Good. Um, I should have checked this earlier, but Matt, I'm having an issue sharing my screen because of recording permission. What was that? Chief working up some details. Oh, oh there we go. I think it's working. Never mind. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Great. And y'all are able to see the presentation? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, well, good night. Thank you for having me again. I'm Marcia Parrott with the Development Finance Initiative, or DFI. I'm speaking, as uh, Bobby said, on behalf of my colleague, Sarah Odio, who y'all know is the driving force and, and brain behind this operation. Um, so I'll do my best to, to do her honor, but she does wish that she could, could be here. 
So just a review of DFI for those who might not be familiar. We're a program of the UNC Chapel Hill School of Government. Uh, we partner with communities all around North Carolina, about 150 so far, to help them realize their public interest, like affordable housing, through transformative real estate projects. So that's what we're doing with Deer County. A review of our engagement with you all. Um, here's our scope of work. I'll run through it quickly. Um, first up was a housing needs assessment, so a, a detailed analysis of supply and demand for affordable housing in Dare County at different income levels and for different household types. So we have completed that. We delivered that to you all in uh, July at a commissioner's meeting, and I'll touch a little bit on that today with some additional qualitative research that we've done through the employer survey. Um, what we're talking about tonight is the identification of two sites for affordable housing. So we don't just want to look at need or do plans. We want to help you all get private development partners to get units built, shovels in the ground. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight is sites for affordable housing. Um, once we've confirmed selection of those sites, we'll move into more detailed site-specific pre-development analysis which essentially involves engaging an architect, an architect who is specialized in affordable housing, while also layering on our own financial feasibility analysis to arrive uh, at a public-private partnership strategy, essentially, to identify a viable path forward to get units built. So once we've identified that path forward, we'll work with you all to do a competitive process to solicit a private development partner and once you've selected that partner, we'll be with you to negotiate the development agreement for those two sites. So we're here till the shovel's in the ground and the units are built. Another way to look at our scope of work, here's a timeline view. Um, you can see here we are today uh, moving into the more detailed pre-development process for the two sites at the pause. A review of our key findings from the market analysis. None of this is a surprise to you all. Um, you know that affordable housing, essential housing, is a, a need in your community, why you engaged us. Um, our findings, main findings, are that although rents are not rising, the supply is dwindling. Um, and particularly, an undersupply of smaller units, one bedroom units in particular, are contributing to a lack of affordability in your community. Your housing need today is that uh, an estimated 1,200 units are needed to meet current demand today for low-income residents. And this doesn't even account for non-resident employee demand um, and folks that would move or come to Dare County that just simply can't. So that's folks living in Dare County, 1,200 today, who desperately need affordable housing. So I wanted to share first the results of the employee housing survey that um, DFI created in partnership with staff um, and, and share a little bit about that additional qualitative information that we got through that employee survey. Uh, we were floored by the response, first of all, to this survey. Approximately 500 businesses responded to this survey, which is a response rate of 14%, really high frankly un unheard of for, for a survey of this kind. So I think that shows the, the energy, the momentum, the desire at a community scale to talk about this issue of essential housing. This chart here shows the business sector, the types of businesses that responded to the survey. You can see it really was a, a big variety, but um, in particular, um, hospitality and short-term rental, tourism, recreation, restaurant, be beverage businesses were those who, who responded, among others. And you can see also the breakdown of employee type for these respondents, year-round versus seasonal workers. So that's who responded. Um, they were able to shed even more light above and beyond that 1,200 unit number um, to quantify the number of employees who are struggling to find essential housing in Dare County. And you see here this key stat is that 5,400 employees struggle to find affordable housing within Dare County. So as a result, many of these employees live outside of the county and face pretty long commute times. So these two graphs here, the one on the left, 
um, shows among different sectors which are commuting from outside the county. And you can see here in quite a few of the sectors, um, actually most of the sectors but for one, business services, half or more of employees live elsewhere and commute into their county. So pretty startling. Do these numbers surprise you all or is this in line with, with what you expected? Pretty much in line with what I was expecting. Kind of uh, what we expect, what, we, what, what our experience is. A lot of people okay. travel into the county to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, I would like to ask, that's okay. we're on this subject right now, with the uh, hospitality short-term rental, yeah. I, I assume that would uh, account for, like, uh, cleaners and stuff coming in for the rental properties. And I know a lot of those, uh, uh, those employees actually live in other areas, in other counties, uh, and you actually come to do that type of a job as a part-time to the regular job. So were those actually counted or discluded or? I'm sure that they were counted. I think um, we didn't get to such a granular level of detail that we asked em employers to provide that, that breakdown. We asked them to report more at a higher level. So I'll give you an example. So for example, we didn't ask them whether they were part-time or full-time employees. That might be a revision that we would make for the survey. But we did ask them to categorize the types of employees according to year-round or seasonal, mm -hmm. as well as individuals, families, students, um, and I'll show you that on this next slide. That said, they could select all that apply. So in the example that you gave of folks coming to clean uh, short-term rentals, that might be a variety of both year-round and seasonal employees, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know whether it's part-time or full-time. What we thought was compelling about this slide is, is that it does show that year-round employees um, do make up the highest need. So although housing for seasonal employees is still very much an issue, um, we did think it was interesting that year-round appears to be the highest need of those categories the one that was selected most often. Does that answer your question, Ish? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if it was broke down that far or not. No, we didn't ask in, in part-time or full-time, um, which, which maybe in a second go we would. Frankly, we tried to keep this survey short and sweet and to the point because um, we didn't want to lose any of our respondents. Now we know there's such an appetite appetite from the business community to respond to a survey like this one. They, they probably could have handled a lengthier survey, but we erred on the side of caution. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so that those stats we just talked about, the 5,400 employees who are unable to find affordable housing in Dare County are those folks that are currently working in Dare County. Um, we learned from our survey that there's also an impact on employee recruitment and retention. So you can see here, 87% of respondents to this question said that yes, the lack of essential housing in Dare County limits our ability to attract and retain employ employees. So it, it is having a negative impact on attracting workers, on, on attracting new talent to the county. Um, and again, this stat here, um, most of the respondents, really an overwhelming amount, said that the ability to attract and retain employees has gotten more difficult in the past five years. So it's a problem and it's getting worse. Again, not surprising to you all, but worth noting. Um, this translated to an estimate that approximately 2,800 people in the past year alone have declined employment in Dare County in the last year due to a lack of housing. So again, um, this really speaks to how this undersupply of affordable housing is limiting an ability to attract new employees to the area and hindering economic development. Again, probably not surprising for you all. Digging in a little bit deeper, um, we did find, again, not surprising, but we confirmed that these three sectors, hospitality, tourism, recreation, and restaurant beverage, are, are the sectors that are most impacted by the affordable housing shortage. Although you can see the blue represents, yes, we're affected. All sectors report being affected. For those who look at data very closely, Commissioner Ross, I know you're the type. 
um, you might say, hey, but education seems to be impacted as well. Um, we chose not to highlight it on the slide just because only two respondents represented the education I actually sector. did just look at that and determined sample size was too small. Exactly. There we go. Um, so I wanted to show this. All right. So uh, this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, the findings from the, from the survey of employers. Again, we were really impressed by the response that we got from the community. And we'll share these findings in a memorandum form with more detail so you can really dig into them. A lot of charts and graphs and findings, but these are just the, the highlights and key takeaways. All right, I'll keep moving. Um, so we know there's a need for affordable housing. Y'all knew that, the data proves it, the survey proves it. So how does affordable housing get built? Um, we've talked about this before, but it's worth covering again. Uh, a key financing source for essential housing is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, or LIHTC for short. This is the, the program that funds the overwhelming majority of affordable housing in this country, and it's what we'll rely on, too, in, in thinking through um, a feasible path for financing housing on, on the county-selected sites. This program provides tax credit equity for acquisition, rehab, or new construction of privately owned affordable rental housing. So this is not public housing. This is privately owned, privately developed affordable rental housing. Um, through this program, affordability is maintained for a period of 30 years. And state agencies in North Carolina, it's the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, or NCHFA, is the body that establishes requirements, awards credits, and monitors projects. So we pay a lot of attention to the rules that NCHFA sets forth in thinking through sites. If uh, a developer is wanting to compete for <clears throat> low-income housing tax credits and become a developer of affordable housing, uh, it's required that they have experience in LIHTC development and management in order to compete. And developers typically get this experience by partnering on a joint venture to, to get projects under their belt. Um, as you all know, you have not seen a low-income housing tax credit program in your county in, in quite a while. I believe the last one was in 2005. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, it's really challenging to find sites that are competitive for low-income housing tax credits. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's worth knowing that Although this is the primary mechanism for financing affordable housing in the United States, it's not something that has been used frequently in Dare County in recent times because of the challenge of finding sites that are uh, that meet the NCHFA, the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency requirements. A quick note on tax credit value. So there are two types of tax credits, the 4% versus the 9%. The 9% is competitive um, and requires certain site eligibility, but is the more desirable tax credit program because, as you can see in this chart here, because of the tax credit equity that it affords you. You can see when comparing the 9% tax credit to the 4% tax credit project that there is more gap financing required for a 4% project, what you see in the lighter blue there. And essentially, that gap financing is the participation of some sort of partner. Um, generally, it tends to be a public partner, a local government, that is helping to make the deal work. So we're trying to look for 9% sites, 9% competitive sites where we can to lessen the amount of gap financing required to make the project work. You'll hear us talk about 4% versus 9%. Tonight, wanted to give you a, a, a good primer um, to understand the basis for that, especially for those citizens who might be following along. Want to set the stage for some financial expectations of the presentation tonight. The phase one analysis that, that we've done so far, which right now we're in phase one, and when we select the two sites and move forward, we'll be entering phase two is a high-level financial analysis. As I mentioned, in phase two, once the sites are selected, we're gonna do more detailed conceptual, conceptual planning, 
environmental assessments, and financial analysis to really understand the public-private partnership strategy that will be required to make these projects work. So we still need to explore what type of P3 investment might be necessary. We'll show you some numbers at a very high level, but again, this is preliminary estimates. Something else to consider that I think speaks to, um, again, why you haven't seen a lot of affordable housing built in your, in your county are construction costs. As y'all know very well, construction costs in Dare County carry a premium of about 15 to 20 percent. Um, and this is notwithstanding COVID impacts on the supply chain um, as of late. So we're considering that in our financial analysis. Here are the rents. Um, that we'll be targeting for, for households at 60% of area median income or less. Um, sometimes we, we, we talk about uh, household income size, but it can be easier to, to understand what type of rents we're talking about. So for one bedroom, we're targeting about $680 in rent, and two bedroom, $810. This could change uh, next year as HUD makes adjustments based on the area median income of Dare County. Generally, these rents represent um, a household spending no more than 30% of their income um, on their housing, which is housing plus utilities. And as we showed on the last side, slide, but worth reiterating here, even projects that receive those 9% tax credits still have a financing gap uh, in Dare County due to the high land values here, here and the construction costs. So what we're trying to prepare you all for is the likelihood that a public-private partnership will be necessary in order to bring these projects to fruition. And at a large scale, again, this is our phase one recommendation. Um, we are predicting that one of the projects, one of the sites that you'll move forward with will be a, a 4% tax credit project, um, the Bowser Town Road site, and the other will be a 9% tax credit project, um, resulting in a total of about 125 units, um, about 17 to 18 and a half million dollars of private investment in tax credit equity and loans, um, and then an additional estimated four to five million dollars of other investment will be required to bring these projects to fruition. Those will likely take the form of, of low interest loans, excludes the value of the land. So setting the stage for some high level financial expectations around these projects, but know that in the next iteration, um, we will provide you with very detailed financial analysis of the private investment to occur proposed recommendations for public investment. I'm going to pause there before I move on to site specifics. Any questions, comments? Good info. I'll keep moving. All right, so our recommendation for project number one is the site that you all know and are very familiar with, Bowser Town Road. So some stats on this site, it's located on California Lane in Mantio. Um, we anticipate that this site could uh, support about 64 units. Um, I know some earlier iterations that predate DFI's involvement looked at what types of affordable housing this site might support and had a lower unit count. Um, so the difference in our unit count, we think it is because uh, the, the previous conceptual drawings um, showed really large bedrooms. I think the one bedrooms were about 1,200 square feet. Um, in our initial analysis of this site, we think an 850 square foot average unit size for one bedrooms is, is more appropriate mm -hmm. and thus lets us yield more units on this site. So again, estimating about 64 units. At the 850 square foot? Yes, sir, at 850 square foot on average unit size. And the two would be a little larger, the one is a slight bit smaller, maybe. Is that what we're saying? Say 1,200. No. 1,200 square feet? No. I think it's no. But two, two bedroom? No. No. No, no, no. No, likely, what would the size for a two bedroom be on, 
likely. I think it's about a thousand square feet. Yeah, that's what she's okay. saying. When I said the 1,200 square feet, I was referring to a, a prior iter analysis of this site that DFI wasn't involved in that showed a lower unit count than what we're estimating here. But we're actually thinking you can get more units out of this site than you previously might have imagined uh, because we thought the, the prior analysis, the square footage, was inflated. Thank Does that you. Make sense? Yep, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the uh, map, and it has 32 structures laid out, and one could assume there's a bottom level and an upper level. Is that fair, Marcia? I'm looking at the uh, handout. Yes. Yeah, there it is. There yep. it is. There we go. Yep, it's appearing. Yeah, so it is. It's a, a bottom level and upper upper, upper upper level exactly, and it over parking. So essentially it looks like three stories, but... Um, the ground floor is parking underneath right. with two housing. Exactly. Again, this was a, an early conceptual model. We'll, we'll want to engage an architect to really refine this. Perhaps they can um, creatively fit in more units than we imagined, but we thought 64 was a safe bet. There are a lot of challenges with this site, and you can see it pretty clearly. Um, there is a, a state-owned and managed boat ramp in the middle of the site that would need to be accommodated. Um, so that creates a, a, an interesting design challenge um, in terms of siting, housing, and parking for this site. Um, but, but not insurmountable also is an amenity that there's a, a, a boat ramp there by the do, site. Do we know how frequently that boat ramp is being used? Anybody know about this? Every day. It, it's used a fair amount. Yeah. Okay. Just but, yeah. curious. There's a, there's a possibility. I mean, we own the land on the other side of the canal, too. The county does. You could talk with the state and see if we couldn't move the boat ramp to the other side. Marcy, let me ask a question. Yes, sir. If I can inter interact here. Please. Is 850, of your projects you've seen in the past, mm -hmm. is that a typical size for a one-bedroom 850 square feet? So that's an average uh, across all of the unit sizes. All right, so we, so an average, so, the, and you've answered my question. So yeah. we could potentially go smaller. And the reason exactly. I say, say that, my wife and I lived in my beach cottage for five years. It was 750 square feet. It was two bedrooms, a full bath, a living room, and a full kitchen. So I'm wondering if we can reduce these sizes to get, I had 900 square feet of deck. I was more deck, I had more deck than I had living space. <laughs> but uh, I'm wondering, if, other, I'm wondering if, if we've looked at smaller units. 850 seems rather large to me for a one bedroom. No, she's saying 850 on average, <laughs> so you'd have 750. I know she said bedroom, average, I know she said average, but I'm um, asking, yeah. my question is, can we go lower <laughs> to get more units? I'm thinking 850 is, subs is sub uh, a substantial size for one bill. Excuse me, mm -hmm. our city. Uh -huh. Right. As, as Commissioner Ross pointed out, I believe the average for one bedrooms is slightly lower. This is being inflated a little bit by the presence of Tell me what's slightly. Give me, give me facts. What's sli what you know, do you I, mean by I slight? Need, I need my counterpart, Sarah Odio, here, who would be able to tell you exactly what we have in the program. But I like where you're going because you're digging into really good details that is what we're going to do in this next phase, which is work with an architect to make the most efficient program possible. So your, the, your lines of questionings are, are definitely in line with what we hope to achieve, which is how do we make the most efficient yet livable um, layout uh, of this housing complex to get as many units as possible, to make them nice, livable, but, but not have any extra square footage. So um, and, and the, the reason I'm going down this road uh -huh. And I hate using that affordable word, but if we if we are talking affordable, mm -hmm. then perhaps the the eight hundred or whatever we go, I go back to your initial slide. 
-hmm. What is it? Uh, let me, let me for finish. rent? The rent. The are, rent. They're That's calculated by formulaic uh, mandate through the legislature. Yeah, 680, 681 bedroom. Yeah, it's a function of taking the average or aggregate median income, Marcia, times 60%. The result is then reduced to a maximum of 30% for rent plus utilities or partial utilities, if I'm recalling. Correct. You're, you are a pro now. Commissioner Ross, yes. I'm sorry? What you call me? You were correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're, you're, uh, you're telling me then with my line of questioning that um, phase one is going to include more detailed conceptual plans and environmental uh, requirements. Uh, yes, sir. And, and it very well may mean that it's lesser than than the, than the average of 850 it could be 750 it could be 650 well uh, for one bedroom see so, the thing of it is it's kind of up to us we can pick it it's well, whether then we or need not to people want to do it that's right. they're what? trying to balance right. a semi market yeah. uh, well I'm, I'm speaking for you Marcy I'm not on your consulting team you you go ahead <coughs> well, well it, it, I, I think we we could be able to lo lower it. So you're absolutely right. In phase two, we're going to do more refined conceptual plans um, and, and really understand the exact unit sizes. Well, when um, you so say, I, I don't, I'm not sure I, I like the word could. You could, could. lower it. We will. We will. Uh, That's right. Pardon? Um, we pardon? will. We will provide you with more detail. Than, well, I, I want to point out one limitation that we have, which um, Commissioner Ross was was talking about with reference to the rents. So as, as Commissioner Ross was just saying, uh, the rents that we have here are based on a formula that is provided to us by HUD, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, passed on through the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. So there are certain rent thresholds that are what they are based on your local area median income and a rule of thumb that Households shouldn't be spending more than thirty percent of their income. So yeah, I'm not I'm not hung up on the rent. Yeah, I was just going to say the rent. I'm not hung up they're, on the rent. I never very, mentioned right, the right. word rent. Mm -hmm. I'm talking I'm square footage. I'm talking right. square footage of the unit. So never so mentioned simple. anything about rent. Right. What, what so I'm simple. what I'm referring to is square footage, and we need right. to we need to maximize as many units <coughs> on that site as we possibly can. Saves and I, construction and I'm, money. And I'm saying 850 square foot on a one bedroom is substantial. Mm -hmm. Yep, we hear you loud and clear. So the reason I was talking about the rents is that similar to having limitations on rents due to the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency and wanting to abide by their, their rules in order to qualify tax credits, the NCHFA, the Housing Finance Agency, also sets parameters on minimum uh, square footage for certain unit types. So, yes, we are going to maximize efficiency and try to get as many units as we can out of this site. We wanted to be realistic and set you up with that 64 number, but we're going to try and achieve more. We certainly will and work with an architect to find efficiencies where we can. There are thresholds in terms of the minimum unit size for certain bedroom types that are set by the Housing Finance Agency. Right. Hey, Marcia. Marcia, question, question yeah, for you. Comes out. Just, Marcia, this is uh, yeah, did while you say that before? Um, Took all this time to tell me that. Commissioner Tobin brought, brought up an interesting, uh, interesting point mm -hmm. a little bit ago, and that is if the parking lot and the uh, boat ramp we're on the other side. My question is, how many additional units would that offer uh, for that for that piece of property? Is that something you could determine? And, and and the reason for asking that is, if it if the number is substantial, if it's meaningful, then we could approach uh, the Wildlife Resources Commission about moving it. If it's if it's not substantial, then you know we, we wouldn't consider it. But that might be something that. Uh, that if you just uh, uh, pretended that that lot was just barren, that you could put anything on it anywhere, be interesting to see how many additional uh, units you could get in there. Right. 
Marcy, let me ask you. Certain. Let me ask you another question. Okay. In order to qualify for the four percent tax credit. Yes, sir. Is that a criteria that the feds or whoever says that it has to be that eight hundred and fifty square feet? So is that what is that is that why that's there in order to qualify for the four percent? Yes, sir. We designed our initial preliminary concept rendering is with those requirements in mind of what they require for the minimum. So exactly. so what I guess my question to you again is other mm -hmm. projects you've done. Has other projects qualified for the 4% less than the 850 square feet for one bedroom? And I know I'm driving this home, but it's, it's important. It, it, it's, all about, um, it's all about maximizing the amount on the site. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm repeating or I'm driving these questions. They won't let you build them 550 feet. They won't let you do it. They're too small. Gotcha. Well, I didn't say five feet. No, no, I know. I did for extreme example okay, purposes. Okay, I got you. That's okay. I mean, the eight fifty is an average. That that's that's taking the right. large ones and the small and the one bedroom. Right. So you yeah. Average it to eight fifty. So, I mean, if you're talking about bringing the average down to seven fifty, that's one thing. But yeah. If, what what, but what, my, what what Sarah needs to do is come back and tell us what's the minimum. What, right. what are the one bedrooms? That's right. Square footage of the one bedroom. That, that will qualify for that four percent. Well, she ain't gonna tell us anything different. Well, I, I didn't think so. Right. I, I hear you loud and clear, Commissioner. In this next iteration, we are going to try and get as many units as we can in the most efficient way possible, in a way that that maximizes unit count while still respecting the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency guidelines. So it's a delicate dance, but one that we've done before, and we're confident that we're going to bring you the most efficient program possible in this next and, phase. And, and uh, let me just fill in Marcia real quick, uh, the chair and vice chair I wanted to illustrate. Uh, I, I had uh, earlier naively assumed the calculation of rentals was a straightforward median income times a percentage times a housing limited percentage to give the target rental. That would be incorrect, Rob. The calculation is various family sizes, various income levels mixed on a various percentage mix to come up with, as Marcia pointed out, one bedrooms about $700 a month and two bedrooms, roughly $850 a month. I know I've rounded a couple bucks in there, Marcia, but that's, again, I was driving toward a math model that would give me the answer, and each time I was told, N no, N no. There's another variable. There's another variable, there's another government reg. If you're a one bed, or sorry, if you're a single household, married, married with a child, married with two, married with three, and those are all weighted and uh, it's a bit more complex. So I struggled with trying to get to the point and each time it was uh, sort of more buried in weeds in the government regs than I <laughs> preferred. Okay, sorry, just wanted to. So Marcy, uh, yes, back sir. to Commissioner Overman's question, if I didn't hear answer, if we move the boat ramp where the parking lot is and put houses there, is that feasible? Certainly, so long as we were able to move the boat ramp, yes, we could achieve more density, more units on this site if the boat ramp, boat ramp were in a condition. That's why I asked how many people are using it. If it's thousands, okay, but if it's 12. No, it's, it's, right. it's used. Yeah. yeah. Um, we didn't know that, that removing, that moving the boat ramp was, was a consideration, so um, I would suggest that, it, that, that if that's a possibility, let's inquire and find out, and we can get to modeling that. And we can uh, still create... It, it may change your whole layout. I, I mean, it, right. it could potentially exactly. change your entire layout for how you're putting things yeah. in there. Exactly. It would, yep. And we would definitely achieve more density. No, I would more bang for your, it might be putting a couple of cl clusters there. Well, great. That, that's helpful direction. Um, we can get with, with staff after this meeting to 
um, talk about inquiring with, with the state about what it would take to move the boat ramp. And if we hear that that's a possibility, we can move forward with two Sorry, parallel analyses in phase two for this site. One that assumes the boat ramp is what it is and we need to work around it, and one that assumes the, the boat ramp um, can be moved. So that way, depending the outcome, we can be ready for both possibilities. We could, we could look at it that way. All right, a couple other things worth noting about this site. Um, one is that it would require a rezoning with the town of, of Manio. As it is, um, the way that, that it's currently written, um, more density for affordable housing on this site is only allowed if it's being developed by the Dare County CDC. So we would want um, to request a rezoning to allow for density um, notwithstanding involvement from the CDC, so something to consider. Um, we think municipal sewer connection is, is possible. Um, and something else we wanted to, to bring up that we think could be a, a good way to approach this site <laughs> is looking not just at 4% LIHTC, but perhaps even mixed income housing. And I think with the boat ramp gone, that would certainly open up even more possibilities for having a mix of both market rate, so conventional housing mixed in with uh, affordable LIHTC housing. So we think that could be an interesting scenario to explore. Um, something else we want to consider when, when we model this site in phase two is uh, doing naturally affordable housing, which essentially is maybe to your point earlier, um, I think it's Commissioner Overman, um, make designing unit sizes that are very small and efficient so that they are naturally affordable by virtue of the small square footage. So there's a lot of different ways you can look at this with cooperative housing or shared housing models. So that's something that we think is, is worth exploring for the Bowser Town Road site. Marcia, I think uh, one talking point that may help you with the state boat ramp is, is that that boat ramp is a poten potential safety, uh, safety, con uh, safety conflict and uh, could lead to uh, conflicts uh, a relocation if if there's an open door hopefully we can pursue it because it's a game it, it'll change the game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. agree oh Look heck forward yeah to i mean 80 units because i just looked visually it appears mm -hmm. you could put eight more structures top and bottom mm -hmm. for 16 units Probably that would alter the economics here marcia dramatically in my opinion Definitely. Our, our in-house designer had a heck of a time trying to figure out how to design as many units as possible around these boat, this boat ramp. So, yeah, it would be a game changer for sure. All right. Any more comments or questions on, on Bowser Town Road? I've gotten some great directions, possibility of, of moving the boat ramp. Um, wanting to do as efficient a program as possible with efficient square footage sizes so that we can maximize unit count. Can we hear you? Now, is it, is it my, uh, my understanding this would not apply for the uh, higher percentage rate because it is close to a water treatment system? Yes, sir. Thank you for, for bringing that up. It does not yeah. compete for the 9% tax credit because of its proximity to the, the treatment plant. Exactly. Thank you. And we inquired with the Housing Finance Agency, um, tried to see if there was wiggle room, but there is not. Of course not. <laughs> Did I keep moving? Yep. Yes, ma'am. We're good. All right. So our recommendation for the second project is to pursue a 9% site, um, which right now the only options for 9% sites are privately owned. So a reminder, you provided a nice transition for this, but the criteria for the 9% site identification are, are many, but we'll highlight a few that are particularly important. Um, has to have a potential for a minimum density of 60 units. So that's one of the qualifications for a 9% site. Has to be outside the 100 year flood zones and wetland areas. Has to have the ability to minimize costs. So <clears throat> potential for sewer water connection, no significant demolition. There has to be a feasible path to site control, obviously. Um, so it has to be a site that the county can get, get ownership for. Here are some of the additional requirements for that 9% scoring. Um, so 
for example, as we were just discussing with the Bowser Town Road site, um, there is what the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency considers an incompatible use, a treatment plant, uh, within a certain distance to the site, and, and therefore it, it does not uh, compete. Um, some of the other things that are important is uh, proximity of amenities, like grocery stores, pharmacy, shopping, um, healthcare facilities, schools, different characteristics of the, the neighborhood. So in order to be competitive, the site shouldn't be in an area that already has a lot of distressed or, or blighted or vacant housing. Um, needs to be close to, to bus or transit within walking distance and also has to be visible. There are also a, a whole host of, of other requirements per the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, um, but here are some of the, the key ones. In our last presentation to, to you all, I believe we showed you a map of competitive areas in Dare County based on these criteria. Um, and as you know, it is very challenging. Um, there are not many areas within Dare County that are competitive for 9% projects, which is why you haven't seen projects of, the, of that kind in your county. Um, I think at the last meeting, one of the commissioners asked us to look into East Lake as a, a potential area for competitive 9% LIHTC projects, and unfortunately, no, it did not meet the criteria. It doesn't have wastewater treatment. I believe it was wastewater treatment and yeah. also distance from some of these right. amenities as well. All right, so with this criteria in mind, we went through a process of mapping competitive areas, identifying sites, and then doing site planning for these sites, uh, much like you just saw for Bowser Town Road, we did an initial high-level test fit from both a, an architectural standpoint and a financial standpoint um, to think about whether or not these sites were good candidates for the 9% the tax credit. And we did identify several sites. Um, we have a few options for 9% LIHTC sites. As I mentioned, though, none of these are currently owned by the county. All of these are, are privately owned. So we're gonna discuss these options further with staff and work with staff to get uh, for the board uh, prioritization of these sites if you have prioritization. It, it might be that um, the sites that we go for are the ones that we're able to secure site control of. That might be a limiting factor, but we'll work with staff to get further direction on these sites. Um, so that's it for the 9% the presentation. On to, to next steps. Um, we're looking for direction from you all to begin the phase two analysis on Bowser Town Road. So that's project number one, which would mean engaging an architect to develop conceptual plans, and we would explore both affordable housing and mixed income housing scenario. We also want to explore site control, which would be an option on a potential 9% tax credit site, and then also do phase two analysis for that site. And then we'll come before you with our phase two findings, um, presenting a public-private partnership strategy, give you very detailed information on the, the program, so the unit sizing and the unit mix and the rents, because we know that y'all want that kind of detail. Um, and then if you're ready to move forward, we'll work with you all to solicit a, a private development partner. Marcia, what's your, what's your timeline to present phase two findings to the board? To present phase two findings? Um, it shouldn't take us but a couple of months to work on Bowser Town Road. I mean, notwithstanding the holidays and kind of our ability to get you all together. Um, but we could move pretty quickly. Um, I think... So we're looking at the first... Hearing, we're looking at January? I think January is reasonable. I think the big questions would be the boat ramp is a big unknown. If there is a potential <coughs> to, to move the boat ramp, I think we'd want to know more about that in our modeling um, before we move forward. Um, with project number two, the 9% site, um, the, the limiting factor that would limit our timeline would be site control. So are we able to get site control and what's that process look like? Um, that said, we're, we're ready to, to move quickly because we know this is an urgent need. We know y'all are motivated to, to make this happen and we are too. To, to engage the architect, which appears to be the next step, 
Mm -hmm. Is that something that we do as our typical RFP, pro RFQ process? We engage an architect like we would do for any other project, or is that something that you do? You would engage the architect, and we would work closely with them, but we can uh, assist you, staff, with, okay. with engaging the architect. Um, it could be an RFQ process. Um, in other communities, we've, we've worked with um, the, the cost of the architect was below a, a threshold that, that required an RFQ, so um, we can talk with you all about different options moving forward um, and recommendations we might have based on our experience with other communities. But, but you would engage the architect. But the statute that requires the RFQ applies. There's no exception for an affordable housing project. Yeah. Are you asking or, or? I'm asking. Oh. In other communities that we've worked with, and I'll have to get back to you, Bobby, on what statute they were able to use. My understanding is that because this is a, a specialized design service, they were, and because of the amount of the contract, they were able to engage directly with an architect, but I can look more into and, and give you advice on on what statutory authority they use to do that. Yeah, that'd be is very there helpful. Any, is there any yeah. advantage to using a uh, an architect that has done these projects before? Could you kind of lead us in those kind of directions? Right. Absolutely. We will absolutely want to engage an architect that is experienced with LIHTC housing. So. Um, as the commissioners w were commenting and pointing out, um, the nuances of working within the limitations set forth through the LIHTC program are really complex. So we most definitely want to engage an architect that has experience with this specific type of housing. Um, and we've got a, a good Rolodex of who those architects are around the state and can um, help identify potential options for you all. Do you, do you have a draft? RFQ with the criteria in it that we could use as a go by? We do. Okay. Yes. You send that to we me have quick. examples from other communities. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, the action item for tonight would be for the board to authorize us to begin the RFQ process to select. The architect is that <coughs> what we need coming out of tonight? I believe so, as well as confirmation that we want to move forward with Bowser Town Road, um, as well as exploring site control for for an additional site. So moved. Yes. Second. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner House. Uh, Commissioner seconded by Commissioner Bateman. Any further discussion? Hearing those, none. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <coughs> Motion carries unanimously. <you> <coughs> So, uh, Marcy, are you gonna you're gonna provide us a, a draft uh, RFQ for our architect for our county manager county manager to use to use? Um, yes, yes, sir. We'll provide you with examples from other communities we've worked with. Of how and they then, then you're gonna different. then you'll explore the uh, housing only and in mixed income scenarios. Yes, correct. And, and we can, and you said depending on if we can move the boat ramp, why, why, can't, we, why can't we move f f forward um, with, with uh, not depending on moving the boat ramp? And then if that scenario falls in place, uh, <laughs> we... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, during the meeting, I texted our project manager. He's going to find out tomorrow about the cost of moving the boat ramp from the state, and also we got to look at whether we even own it or the state owns it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is where are we going to move it to? When you look across the <laughs> waterway, there's land, but right. I don't know if it's wetland that we could fill and make parking lots and all that. So there's some looking we got to do to gotcha. see if that's viable. Right. We've it, it started that to, tonight. Yeah, yeah it definitely. Doesn't yeah. have to lay the same way. I mean, right now it's sort of vertical to the it's right. perpendicular to oh. the to the to the to the ditch. The, the, the other side could be parallel to the ditch with just right. the, the, the landings. Likely, so. the, likely we would have to pay for it. Likely the state has money to build new boat ramps, much as they're doing in Rodanthe, mm -hmm. but they're not going to use their construction funds for new boat ramps to build, to, to rebuild them. one yeah. that's already existing. Right. So yeah. that would be our cost. We would have to do that cost-benefit analysis that right. you suggested earlier right. to see if it's worth it for the number right. of units. 
that we get, but more important, we got to have a place to put it, and that's what we have to evaluate across the waterway. Is that land suitable to that type of development? And, and it may or may not. But looking at the map, it looks like wetlands to me, but I don't know. We'd have to take a closer look. I, I, what, I, was, what was the what was the property? <coughs> what, what did the property bear, Bobby, where it is now? What did it look like prior to? I mean, it's, it's just across the ditch. Yeah, if you look at the property where this is, it's this got is pine wetlands. trees growing on it. If you look across the ditch, it looks like marsh. Look at yeah. wetlands. What he said it looks like. Okay, I'll, I'll have to go. So I, I don't know, but we can follow up on that quickly. I, I just yeah. don't want. I don't want the process to be held up for three or four weeks waiting for us to get an answer well, right. uh, Hopefully, on a boat ramp. I want us to move forward. My and, intention would be to get an answer on the boat ramp while we're going through the RFQ process. And by the time we hire the architect, we'll know for sure. We'll know. Absolutely. We give him yeah. his guidance on what to design on. That Absolutely. Would be the goal. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any further and questions, have, Marcy? I just wanted to add that we can assist with that cost benefit analysis. So if we are able to move the boat ramp and we know the cost of move, moving the boat ramp and if that cost is a, a burden that the county will bear we can help you all consider comparing that cost against perhaps pursuing a, another privately owned nine percent site and what that cost benefit analysis is in terms of public money put into the deal and the yield on affordable housing units so um if, oh, if I was, we're positive i was, on finding out we can I was hoping you'd Found some money for us. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. 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 Uh, sure. Hey, Marcia, real quick, it's Rob. Yep. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. Go for it. Can you give me your assessment, having now been with us, working the area, been here on the ground, talking to us and others in the community, does the 9% scenario represent a reasonable probability of success that we aren't just kind of uh, no. chasing unicorns that we will never catch, but we can actually secure a site that will qualify and can be a 9% site. I'm, I'm trying to determine, is this thing really possible or, or, or are we just, you know, chasing rainbows? Right. It's difficult. So there's a reason you haven't seen 9% projects in your county. First two words, somewhere. folks, it's difficult. It's difficult. That said, it, we're optimistic. So the options that we did identify, we are really excited about. We think that they would make for fabulous 9% projects, and we're only going to bring you sites. The sites we've identified are only sites that we know are extremely competitive. They meet all the criteria and get perfect scores, which is what you need to, to compete. Um, that said, as we've told you, there is a limited amount of 9% tax credits each year and developers have to compete on a statewide basis to get those cre credits. However, uh, the fact that Dare County hasn't had a 9% project in over a decade, I think is a positive indicator. And if I were the housing finance agency, would, would make me want to invest in Dare County. So You're hard. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so we we're pretty hard. Great sites. <laughs> we're paying her. She's talking to us. <laughs> Thanks, Marcia. That, that, that answers the question, though. Seriously, it does. Thank you. The question that we need to answer, though, is the path to site control. So that's the big unknown is yep. um, can we secure these sites and can we secure them at an acquisition price that makes sense for our financial model? And we'll know the answer to those questions really soon. So if we're exploring site control, those are the two big unknowns. Can we get them and how much will it cost to get them and what does that mean for our financial model? Okay. So the sites are fabulous, but we'll see. Thanks, Unless anyone Marcia. has any more questions, Marcia, thank you so much for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all, and, and I'll be in touch on next steps. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcia. Thanks, Marcia. Oh. Right. <clears throat> County Manager? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, items five and six will be presented by Dave Clawson. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. Um, I know that Item five, the county manager briefed you on this last week. Um, we have a, a change order for the COA project with Barnhill Construction. Uh, during the demolition process, their uh, subcontractor, D.H. Griffin, um, discovered two items. One was 
588 linear feet of pipe that had bag insulation that wasn't on either a, we had, we had a 2001 hazardous materials report and a 2017 hazardous materials report, and it was covered by ceilings and walls, and it wasn't on either one of those reports. Uh, the other thing was the gymnasium floor. Uh, they know what they told us was if it was built between 1960 and 1980, they knew that they needed to test the epoxy floor, and that floor contains mercury. Um, the floor has to be remediated and scraped up. They described it with a like a straight edge scraping machine so that there's no serrated edges and no dust, either with the machine or by hand. Then it's gotta be taken in specialty lined trucks to a specialty landfill, the closest of which is in Alabama. So uh, between those two items, our uh, initial change order price was $140,311. Um, what we've done is in the second section, in the middle section of my summary, um, we've updated the project estimate from the last time we were before the board, the architect was before the board and Barnhill was, uh, or well, the Capital Improvements Committee took the results of a meeting with those two. And you said a not to exceed number for the estimate at the design development stage. Um, they've given one update uh, based on 95% complete construction documents. And I've updated a, the third column on the, on the estimate schedule for these change orders. Um, with everything all together, we're $107,466 under your not to exceed estimate with this change order and the other changes that I'm asking you to approve in the estimate. Um, they include the um, Barnhill increased their estimate by $12,957 on the 95% drawings. You have this change order. Related to this change order, we have to have a, uh, an abatement monitor, so their hours have greatly gone up. Um, Construction testing, we were working with an estimate from the architect of 150,000. We've got a, a proposal and a quote from GET, which is the company that does the construction testing at 80,000, so that's a $70,000 reduction. Um, the chairman last um, meeting, we got the commitment, you got the commitment from COA to cover the furniture fixtures and right. equipment, so that's 261,000 to the good. Um, the architect updated their estimate on the commissioning contract, say for HVAC and things at the end of the project. Uh, that was a $15,000 increase. I increased our estimate for Dominion Power by $50,000. We had $50,000 in there. The animal shelter's $34,000 and some odd dollars, so I increased COA to $100,000 um, based on input from Brent Johnson, our project manager, uh, just on how much work there would have to be done. And then, uh, you know, we kept the owner's contingency at 1%, and that leaves us $107,000 to the good. Um, I'm also including a budget uh, change to the capital project ordinance to cover uh, the change order, the change in the owner's cost, which is from the, the, the monitor, and uh, the construction testing. And, um, you know, I've been playing around with owner's contingency. There's no point in having an owner's contingency budget until we get the GMP from the contractor and then set it at the 1%. So the increase in the budget is only $48,088. Um, now, <laughs> that being said, the, the original documents that um, Cheryl has are $2,000 more to the goods. We, with Brent, worked with Barnhill and got their amount for that change order changed from uh, um, $140,311 down to $129,938. Uh, but then on the other side, we also had the monitor that got a more comprehensive idea of how many hours they were gonna have to spend. So um, that went up by almost as much as we got the change order reduced by. So instead of being 107,000 to the good, we're 109,000 to the good. And if you want those original documents, I've got them here, I can hand them out to you. But, um, um, so what we're asking is uh, if you'll 
authorize the county manager to execute the uh, change order number one with Barnhill Contracting and adopt uh, the amendment to the budget in the form of the capital project ordinance. So moved. Okay, motion on the floor okay. by Commissioner Ross to authorize the county manager to ex execute the Barnhill contract change order number one and also to adopt the amendment to the capital project ordinance. I believe it was uh, seconded by the vice chair. Yep. So any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion then signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign? Motion carries unanimous. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. You know on number six as yes, well, sir. right? Um, I think this one's easy. Um, Bobby and I were uh, contacted by Mr. Jim Klingler, who wanted to make us know of the availability that there were still some um, Hurricane Dorian-related money available with the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency, which the state created with Hurricane Florence. Um, and so we submitted the application that's included in your packet. Um, I went through and identified what items were uh, that we had that met some of their criteria. One of them was um, a, a vehicle for emergency management. Another one was that if you'd had Hurricane Dorian costs that had not been reimbursed by FEMA or the state. And we had both of those. Um, and then the rest, the grant application allowed you to use non um, non hurricane related just straight up operating expenditures uh, you could either pick debt service you could pick payroll i picked payroll um, so we've been um, awarded a grant of a million dollars from that office um, 55000 for the emergency management vehicle, $166,456, which was debris cost that we were not reimbursed by FEMA or the state for Hurricane Dorian. And then the balance is $778,544 uh, to just reimburse the county for uh, fiscal year 2020 payroll costs. That's excellent. I'm, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll go ahead and... Uh, I'll go ahead and move that we authorize uh, the county manager to execute that MOA with the Office of uh, Recovery. <laughs> yes. I, uh, million dollars. Yeah. Brother, they got my I'll, attention. I'll yeah. yeah, they're nice. <laughs> and the, uh, there's a budget amendment in there. And a budget and, amendment. And it's and a new it. fund, which is part of their requirements. And we yes, said, sir. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Good job. There. We got Good a motion. Job. We got a motion on the floor Second. by Commissioner Couch by to Hall. authorize the county manager to execute the MOA with the uh, North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resilience for a million bucks and to also adopt the uh, budget amendment. And it's been seconded by Commissioner House. Um, floor is open for further discussion. I would just ask everybody to look quickly at page 53 for an excellent summary of what we've just voted on, or not voted on, but motion to approve. And I think it's excellent. We moved $413,000 from our general fund to disaster recovery. And Dave, thank you for this. This is a very, very good explanation of how and where the funds will be used and why they are so appropriate for us. So, yeah. excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion on the floor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you so much, Dave. Chairman, item seven on the agenda is a consent agenda. On the consent agenda, you have the approval of the minutes from October 5th. You have the schedule of the meeting dates for 2021. The tax collector's report. A budget amendment for the elections department for additional CARES grant fund and ele for election day expenses. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Public Health, COVID-19 Infection Prevention Funding. Department of Health and Human Services, Public Health, a budget increase for additional vaccines and a water department budget transfer. Move to approve the consent agenda. <clears throat> Motion on the floor by Commissioner House. I'll second it. To approve the consent agenda as presented and it's been seconded by Commissioner Tobin. The floor is open for further discussion. Hearing none, those in favor of this motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <laughs> motion carries unanimous. And that'd be your agenda, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, County Manager. That brings us to item eight this evening. 
and that's uh, commissioner's business, county manager business. And uh, Commissioner Bateman, would you mind kicking this off this evening? Commissioner Bateman is just happy to be here. <laughs> 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 that, thank you, sir. Um, Vice Chairman. Me too. Vice Chairman. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going home. Commissioner House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, this past week, I had a uh, meeting with uh, the uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner of the North Carolina Department of Insurance, Dr. Uh, Michelle Osborne, along with the uh, uh, um, General Assembly liaison, Bob Mays, and also several of the fire chiefs here in, uh, in Dare County. Uh, they wanted to get a brief uh, rundown from our uh, fire departments if they needed anything, especially with COVID-19 going and everything else, just to kind of reach out to them. One thing that, that really became uh, apparent in that meeting is that, uh, and they, they really stressed this and pointed out that, that the uh, Department of Insurance is, is fighting for it, um, Workman's comp insurance is not regulated by the North Carolina uh, Insurance Commission. It's a separate entity all in its own. And one of the things that they're running into now is that with our uh, first responders, uh, they're not counting COVID-19 cases as workman's comp. So if you're a first responder and you come, out, come down with COVID-19, it actually has to do with your uh, private insurance and not with the, uh, not with the workman's comp claim. And uh, they're trying to get that changed uh, to say that um, it's, it's kind of more likely that a, uh, an emergency service worker would get it at work than it would be at home. Um, so they're, they're working on that, which I thought was, was interesting uh, out of the whole uh, the conversations that we had with them. Um, our SPCA, as we were just talking about, we're building a new building, but they're also... Uh, looking at outfitting it uh, with some of the creature comforts that some of the animals and staff might, might need. So they do have a uh, current program going on, fundraiser, that you can buy a brick uh, to be placed out in, in their, uh, in their uh, walkway up to the building. And with that donation, we'll help them to get those extra things they need for the pets and for the, uh, the people working in there as well. And with that being said, we do have a pet of the week. We have Batman, not the superhero, it's a nice little kitten. We now have a pet of the week. Batman is a playful and energetic four-month-old kitten. He loves other cats. He is young enough to get along with cat-friendly dogs. And Batman is fully, has a full personality and spunk and ready to find his forever home and fight crime wherever she sees it. Our pet of the week for this week is Batman. Batman is a four-month-old little ball of fluff and fun. He has a ton of personality, Whatever. spunk, and is a natural entertainer. Batman loves other cats and is young enough to adapt to life with cat-friendly dogs. Batman and his many other kitten friends are eager to find their forever homes and might be easily persuaded to dress up in Halloween costumes with you. To adopt Batman or foster one of our other animals, you can come and visit us Earth on here. You Saturday able to watch at this shelter video? located in Manio. Yeah, Join us this Friday oh, afternoon, on ours. October 23rd, yeah. at the it's Collington on Harbor Museum. Oh, yeah. I got to get you. Four. Yeah. Our adorable, adaptable, and artistically yeah. inclined yeah. pups yeah. will be there yeah. accompanying all the local artists for their fall art walk. We'll also have all the info you need to purchase a brick on the spot for our new building ah, fundraiser. For more information, up. visit our website at www.obxspca.org or visit our OBXSPCA yeah. Facebook page. Mine just I clicked it off, then clicked it on again. And that's all I have. I, I wish everybody a very safe and happy Halloween. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner House. Commissioner Ross. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had prepared a rather lengthy letter, and it, uh, I'm going to abbreviate it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, in the last four days, a rather significant story was published in one of our major metropolitan newspapers, the New York Post. The story had direct impacts on the current very contentious presidential campaign. My letter, my purpose, my reason for commenting was to ask a few questions, not about is it right or true, not about do you favor one candidate or the other. My questions were as follows. 
have any of us witnessed a more sophisticated or a more coordinated, and, and again, I will preface that I'm really looking at how has the press responded to the story, how has social media responded to the story, and how has the premier law enforcement agency, the FBI, responded to the story? I'm not even going to mention the story. I'm just going to mention the journalism. Each of the major networks, NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN, MSNBC, PBS, I, I searched PBS, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Boston Herald, all ignored the story completely. There was no mention. And my question was, geez, when's the last time I saw every major news outlet with exactly the same timing on the exact same story report nothing? I honestly marveled at the sophistication and coordination of that. The other one that caught my eye was the simultaneous shutdown and blocking of any sharing or transmission of the story by two of the major technology platform monopolies, Twitter and Facebook. I mean, these guys are very big. They're very, very powerful. In fact, I saw one report saying that 60% of Americans surveyed get their news from social media platforms. And they basically blocked on Twitter any account that shared this story from the New York Post. And Facebook also stopped any stories or transmission. So I thought, hmm, all of the, and I guess there are indeed millions in the US but maybe hundreds of thousands attempted to read or share and exercise what used to be called the First Amendment right of free speech and were told, no, not here, not any longer. I thought the rather amazing shutdown and blocking of speech was noteworthy, I guess I would say. And finally, there was an assertion made, could have been true, could have not been true, that certain evidence and materials were transmitted, presented to the FBI in December of last year. And a senior ranking member of the United States Senate wrote a letter to the FBI saying, can you please confirm that you have received this equipment, uh, what was done with it, and where is this equipment? And I just read yesterday that the answer was, we shall neither confirm nor deny anything related to this particular piece of equipment, which when I considered the elected member of the Senate ask the appointed members of the FBI, do you have it? Not, is it right, wrong, whichever, but we're not going to answer. Uh, I guess I came away with a chilling feeling of where are the swarms of investigative journalists that should one way or the other debunk such a story, prove it to be a hoax, and those perpetrating this kind of a story be either both exposed and, if appropriate, prosecuted or reveal and discover what is the truth of the story. But neither has happened. And I actually approached a number of members of our local press, to which I sort of got the, well, it's sort of a national story and we focus on local events. Okay. I kind of looked at it and said, censorship, free speech, preeminent law enforcement agency, maybe in the world, looking back at the United States Senate and saying, we're not going to answer you. You don't have a right to know. Uh, I found it unbelievable, is what I guess I'm saying. And perhaps nobody else noted this. Perhaps nobody else felt it was much of a to-do. Well, I thought it was a lot of to-do about a lot. And I'm hopeful that one way or the other, the journalists that operate in our free press will indeed seek 
and expose what is the truth. Because I'll close with Justice Lewis Brandeis, quite a while ago, actually, was noted to have said, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. So why all the shadows? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Rice, Rice, Ross. <clears throat> Commissioner Tobin? That's a tough one to follow. Yes, it is. On the bright side, the day before the election, there's supposed to be a big meteorite that's going to hit Earth. I did. I so, saw that. So <laughs> maybe we won't that. have to worry about it. We're all dead. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, we had an uh, organizational task force meeting this past week. And uh, some of the takeaways from that meeting, I think the, the most important one is the inlet's in really poor shape right now. Uh, but starting on the 26th, the Merritt will be coming out of the yard. It's over in Mans Harbor right now. And it'll only spend about three days here, tentatively. Uh, that'd be the 26th, the 27th, and the 28th. Um, but then right on its heels, uh, the Curry Tuck should be here. Uh, the 28th through December 7th, and then uh, right on its heels, the Merton should be here uh, around the 27th of, uh, or cor correction, or the Merton should be here around December 7th and be here right through the first of the year. So we should have some decent dredging coming up, we hope. Um, and also at that meeting, uh, well, it was at the MOA meeting down in, that was virtual that takes place in Merton, I mean, in, um, in New Bern. Um, Roger Bullock uh, announced his retirement, and he will not be attending the next meeting. Uh, we're losing a good one there, but uh, Roger fully deserves his retirement, and he'll be fishing a lot on his <laughs> new pier. Uh, along those same lines um, of dredging, uh, we're looking towards a mid-November uh, meeting down in uh, Louisiana for a pre-construction meeting some, sometime after the election and sometime before Thanksgiving is the general time frame. Um, and also, basically along the same dredging thing, uh, this Wednesday, uh, Congressman Murphy's office reached out to me and wanted to get a, uh, a tour of the inlet. So. Uh, this Wednesday, he'll be here uh, along with uh, some of his people, and Chairman Woodard and Steve are both going to go along. Um, we've got Russ King from the Oregon Inlet Fishing Center. We're going to take a, a, a boat ride down there, uh, kind of do uh, the, the normal tour that we do, try to educate him on our needs, take him into uh, the... Uh, Broad Creek Basin and show them what goes on in there and then uh, just try to educate them. But I think it'll be a real, real good informal meeting that, that he wants. He's the one who reached out. And that, that's all I've got. And watch out for that meteorite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Put, you. Putting my football helmet on. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Commissioner Couch. Yes, sir. Uh, Attended uh, the latest deck pour there on the Rodanthe Bridge. Uh, uh, it was pre-dawn, uh, and we're riding on the south end, heading toward the north end, and uh, just having the chit-chat and everything with J Jared and a couple of the state inspectors. But there was this massive crescent moon coming up over the ocean. And as you guys know, when you come down the uh, Bass Night Bridge, uh, uh, southbound to Hatteras Island is such a commanding view of the of the barrier islands. But uh, let's not take any do away from when this Rodanthe Bridge is done because it's while it doesn't have the height, it's going to be outstanding view. It was just awesome there. I just kind of stopped and said, "Y'all see that moon?" And it, uh, yeah, we, we see that most every day here. Now let me tell you what we're doing on Bent 97 through <laughs> Bent 101. And they're kind of taking that stuff for granted. I was just floored. But, you know, they're, they've had some problems. They've had their share of challenges, particularly on the north end because of the sediment. Uh, that stuff is so thick that, uh, I mean, they're driving with massive cranes and everything, trying to drive their way through this. Uh, I mean, it's thick. It, it doesn't even perk. 
uh, you pour water and it just pulls there. It doesn't it, it, it doesn't go into the ground. And uh, but now that they're into the sound, I think you're going to see some uh, acceleration going from the north end to try and meet. They won't be meeting uh, in the middle where they initially anticipated. They're going to be meeting closer to the north end. But they're they're on schedule. Uh, they're on target for uh, uh, the pile driving will be done here uh, about this time. Uh, hopefully by the end, end of this year, but uh, we could be, uh, this time next year, 2021, we could be driving on that thing. It's really a fantastic, uh, uh, we, we've become the county of bridges, and it's going to help uh, with the overwash. I know we've got some issues there in the canal zone and everything, but we're going to, this will get Merlot out of the way, and uh, I've, I've been fielding calls all the time, and I, I look, folks, it's a DOT thing that people are taking issue with the uh, with the roundabout there, but you know, can you imagine if there was a stoplight there on a Saturday with the amounts of traffic that we're having? Uh, we're seeing 35, 40 percent increases in gross rentals on on properties, and there'd be a five mile backup. It, that bridge would be at a standstill on a Saturday. So the roundabout is. Uh, I trust the engineers, the DOT guys. They know what they're doing. Uh, you come off of that bridge, you'll be you're going into a 35 mile an hour zone anyway. So, but it, it's a really an impressive project, and hopefully, as we get a little further into this, we can get one of the guys to come here and give us a maybe even Pablo or somebody to give us an update. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Where's concrete coming? Uh, c concrete's coming out of the Nags Head plant. You'll remember that, uh, yeah, yep. uh, Rodanthe, they, uh, they're, but they're, they're playing by the rules, and yep. uh, but, I mean, it's a 24-hour operation. A lot of camaraderie on there. The inspectors are, they're, they're doing their job, but they're not, uh, they're just monitoring things and making sure that it's done. Uh, correctly, but there's a, there's there's a lot of that's going to be an expensive bridge, nowhere near the Bass Knight Bridge, but it's going to be solid, be beautiful structure. Yeah, thank couldn't you. Ag couldn't agree more. I, thank you, Danny, for um, explaining why the North End was so slow. I was <laughs> curious why the North End was moving so slow. So appreciate you. This goes back to the fourth and final ice age, yeah. the Pleistocene era there. I get an education every time I'm out there. These guys are pretty sharp. Yeah. So, well, thank you. County Manager. Yes, sir. I have one thing. Um, as you recall, we had CARES Act money that we got that we've done a plan for that how we were going to spend and allocate that CARES Act money. Um, since the last time we updated the plan, um, some new guidelines have come out that would allow us to use some of that money for daycare businesses uh, in the community. And as you know, we've had several meetings with the Children and Youth Partnership as well as, well as some of the daycare folks concerning the issues we have with daycare in Dare County. And so we reached out to the Children and Youth Partnership and asked them to get in touch with the various daycares and see what COVID-related expenses um, they had had uh, up until now and what expenses they anticipated between now and the end of the month and asked them to get those to us, um, get us the documentation for those kinds of things and all that. And late last week, we got that information from them. Uh, Dave and Ernie in finance have been going through that to try to vet them to make sure they meet the requirements and all that sort of thing. And we haven't completed that process yet. Um, the expenses break down two ways. One are the things that you would expect, PPEs and equipment and all that kind of stuff. And then there were a couple that had some expenses for uh, staff expenses or things like that that really didn't fit well within the, the guidelines and, and with the way that uh, you know, we were trying to vet those to make them all fit and, and distribute the money fairly. Uh, the upshot of all that is, is if you take the ones that um, meet the guidelines clearly and all that and exclude the uh, staffing issue, the staffing requests, there's about $70,000 of expenses across several multiple daycare operations. And what we would ask you for tonight is to allow us to spend $70,000 to uh, cover some of those COVID-related expenses. Um, 
the net effect of what we would do is it would reduce the amount that we're using for our own COVID-related expenses, but we can cover that. You've heard some of the things that Dave talked about tonight, so we're okay there, uh, but it would allow us to go back and, and uh, cover some of those costs to the daycare providers. Um, I say give me a not to exceed 70 because it may not, we may not spend the whole 70 based on whatever the audit that, that Ernie and Dave do, but once they complete that, we'd like to distribute that money uh, right away before the next meeting, and it won't exceed that 70,000, uh, and it will cover um, some of those expenses. Um, we don't have to amend our plan because we're going to take it out of our fund to pay it, and then we get our funds reimbursed by the CARES Act fund, so we'll just take care of them, and when we get our CARES Act money all that straight, we'll cover ourselves for there. So it'll all wash out in the wash from the CARES Act, but initially it'll come out of our own account to, to get those folks covered. So what I need is authority to move in that direction to use up to $70,000 to cover uh, the daycare expenses after Ernie and Dave audit them uh, this week. So move. Second. Okay. There's a motion on the floor by the vice chairman. It's been seconded by Commissioner House. Any further discussion? I just have one question. That doesn't include Head Start. Head Start does it your own, doesn't it? It's, Head Start is not in that. Dave, is there anything else we need to add to what I just said? Um, no, what you said will work. I mean, so y'all know I've had a couple of conversations with NC Pro. It, it's likely going to end up being our money and not CARES Act. Okay. And if it is, it's fine because the CARES Act money re places our money ultimately anyway yeah. so that will that's right it won't exactly. make any difference either way okay there's a motion on the floor any other further discussion hearing none those in favor signify by saying aye aye opposed like sign motion carries unanimous uh and then one last thing thought you said you had one well i didn't think of it till right this second <laughs> <laughs> commissioner house had talked about buying a brick program and i asked dorothy to check into that further get the details and maybe we can publicize that and help them through our website on our, our SPCA page to help them generate some revenue to accomplish their goals. And so Dorothy and her team That'd be great. will work on that as well. Um, uh, addendum to that idea, an even bigger number, but maybe not as large overall, the naming of kennels. Kennels can have a one-year naming right, you know, the... Uh, County Manager Outen Kennel or the Commissioner Tobin Kennel or Commissioner Ross Kennel. And those have been done, those have been sold very successfully in other shelters. And again, the money goes straight for the food, supplies, medicine that the animals need. So I would urge our partners at the SPCA to consider such a thing if they would. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to them about all of their fundraising efforts along those lines and include whatever's there. And yeah. I have kennels, a, we can all be in the doghouse. So. <laughs> <laughs> By golly. Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> wow. Oh, <man. laughs> uh, does that That's complete it. your... <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, County Manager. We'll put a count, we'll put a kennel in your name, make sure you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> Public Information Office, Ms. Hester, do you have anything for us this evening? Thank you, dear. And uh, Finance Director, Mr. Clawson, do you have anything else for us? No, sir. Thank you very much. That brings us to, and I will uh, echo one more time, we live in the greatest country in the world. Please take advantage of exercising your right to vote. Yes, sir. Yes, with, sir. <clears throat> with that being said, is there a motion to adjourn until November the 2nd? So moved. By Second. Commissioner Tobin has been seconded by Second. Commissioner House. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed aye. like sign. Motion carries unanimous.